Chapter 3 The Archon What's with the smicking eye then? You spliced or something? The young pirate with the crooked knife had been put in charge of making sure Jim didn't try anything funny while they finished up business on the trussel. He'd introduced himself simply as North, which was no kind of name Jim had ever heard before. Jim looked around nervously at the rest of the trussel's crew, still bound and kneeling nearby. Hey, don't need to worry about them anymore. Won't be your problem soon. Jim touched his shattered eyeglass nervously. It's not a splice, just a bad eye. I was born with it. North shrugged. It happens. Half the crew here are spliced, some ways back. You see Gam there? He indicated the frail-looking boy with the bandaged skull who waved awkwardly back at North from the far end of top deck. He can hear everything we say, all the way over there. Got some monkey blood there. Gets in his head sometimes. Great lookout, though. Jim wondered what it would be like to have hearing that sensitive. They must have heard the trussel coming from clicks away. What about him? Jim asked, indicating the stairway. The one-legged tattooed boy had been sent down to six to fetch up Jim's welding gear, grumbling as he went. Caber? Him? Nah, that's all natural. Homegrown, rice-fed, bad attitude there. Though I wouldn't be surprised if it came out he had some donkey in him. Jim heard Gam blurt out a laugh from the far side of the deck. North smiled. There was a grunt from below and one of Jim's tanks flew out of the stairwell, clattering heavily on the deck between them. Whoa! Calm it down, ass face! cried North, leaping away from the rolling tank. Caber came grunting up the stair with a half dozen weld tanks gripped in his thick arms, letting them all clatter to the deck at his foot. Get the ones with the swirling pen nieces. Caber panted, his hands on his knees. They've all got fake pens on them, eh? He looked up at North breathlessly. Hey, what do you call me, bro? Jim pulled his old pattern-marked weld torch from the pile of gear, stealing a guilty glance back at Mike. What about the rat? You found the rat, right? Mackett? Yeah, you didn't tell me it was still alive, though. Little thick bit me. He sucked on a finger. You did a good job fattening him up, but catching and slaughtering is worth some too. Here, I'll split it with you. Caber pulled a handful of limp fur from his belt and held it out toward Jim. Mack it. Dead. Jim felt all the colour drain from his face and his knees began to buckle. A heartbeat, and then he was charging at Caber, slapping at his bald head. Whoa! What the fuck? Caber stepped backward over the pile of tanks, his copper peg leg clanging and slipping, and he fell heavily to the deck, arms raised against Jim's blows. Roaring, Caber flung Jim backwards. Pain exploded again in Jim's back, and he found himself unable to breathe as Caber clambered awkwardly to his foot, glaring at the other pirates, who were now laughing all around. Snatching up one of the weld tanks in a fury, he stepped over Jim and raised it high. Hey, how far do you think we'll get exactly? With no shielding, spoke a calm voice. Caber stopped, the tank still raised above his head. He started it, and it's an eye for a nice slip. Articles say so, don't they? Jim twisted and saw the slender, kindly-looking boy with the bandana, hands on his hips. Aye, and it'd be you that gave him that dirty great hole in his back, would it not? Caber hesitated. That's different. That was battle. This is tussle. Battle, was it? A great lump like you sticking a scrap like him in the back? Maybe North can write a song about it, eh, North? Sure thing, Slip, grinned North. I've got some new metaphors I've been saving up. Ah. Oh groaned Caber, dropping the tank back to the deck angrily. He kicked Mackett's body at Jim's chest with his metal foot. Here, I hope you choke. And with that, he stomped away. Jim, is it? asked the kindly boy they'd called Slip. I need you to come with me. Jim cradled Mackett's limp body in trembling hands. The old rat looked peaceful, almost as if he was sleeping, but it was clear his neck had been broken. 
Jim had promised he'd come back for him, and instead he'd sent that awful brute to kill him. He felt Slip hover over his shoulder. Captain don't like to be kept waiting, Jim. Jim nodded and curled Mackett up gently on the deck, wiping his eyes on his sleeve as he stood. Slip smiled sadly at him before motioning for him to follow. He led the way across the top deck to the great open cargo bay that dropped two floors into the belly of the ship. The captain stood with the huge barrel-chested Eastner boy who was pointing down into the hold. We've got a ton of plastics and some scrap metals. Some of the lads clean weapons as first spoils. But no sign of any nighter. The captain cursed. You sure? We opened everything in the hold. Could be she's got stash lockers, but it'll take a day or two to search. She's a big lass. Cap shook his head. No, this one's too fat for smuggling tricks. You. He turned to Jim. What do you know about the cargo? I'm just an engineer. I don't really... There was supposed to be 400 square of nitromite on board. Fertilizer. Crop food. You know anything about that? Fertilizer. Yeah, that's what we took to Gradlon. The captain swore again, long and loud. Slip spoke next. When did you leave Gradlon, lad? Sundown yesterday. Jim checked the sun to orient himself and pointed. It's that way. Maybe 300 clicks? I know where it is! Snapped Cap. He kicked one of the weld tanks hard. It looked like it hurt his foot more than he let on. Fuck, sir! That pox-ridden son of a pig-eating bastard! Pig-eating bastard? Repeated Slip thoughtfully. It's not your best, Cap, but it's got a certain rhythm for sure. Finish up, the captain instructed Slip, before turning angrily back to Jim. You, stash your gear, we're gone. And with that, he whirled away in a rage. Slip. He introduced himself as Will Slippener, helped Jim heft two full sets of weld tanks and a spare torch, and together they dragged them to a pallet that was being loaded with gear and injured pirates to be winched over the gunnels and down to the wooden ship below. Despite his slender frame and kindly manner, the other pirates took orders from Slip without question and set about their tasks with casual efficiency. As the last of the gear was loaded and secured, Jim heard a long, musical whistle from the top of the quarterdeck and turned to see Cap perched there, staring down at the bound crew of the trussel. Listen, we are finished here. You must know we could have killed you, or taken some as slaves, he called, his voice cold and commanding. Trade no more with Gradlon and the other rich keeps, or next time we will not be so gentle-handed. There's other folk that'll buy from you. Folk who need it more. He looked around at the prisoners, giving his words time to sink in. Now, techs have been used here, unshielded. Be underway with haste, and do not follow us, or next time we'll hole you and leave you to the fish. With that, the captain climbed the railing and threw himself clear of the ship. Jim rushed to the grab rail and gasped as he saw Cap fly through the air, head first, splashing into the water between the two vessels, fifty feet below. As Jim stared open-mouthed, there were jubilant calls and battle cries to his left and right, and a dozen other pirates leapt from the ship, some head first, some feet first, some elegant, some chaotic, but all slamming gaily into the water below, laughing and calling as they swam back to the queer wooden ship. Jim's palms were slick with sweat, his knees weak at the very idea of plunging into the water, of drowning. Jim turned to slip, aghast, and found him chuckling and shaking his head. But the sharks... Slip laughed. There are no sharks, lad. Come on. Shark-infested waters. He chuckled again at the notion and yanked a lever on a mechanical winch. The platform jerked into motion, lifting up from the trossel's deck and then slowly down and away. Jim saw a raid, the sour faces of the trossel's crew, the pa and the other engineer kids who had sold him out. Some tried to stand 
and fight against their bonds, but most just stared and seethed. When the platform was a few feet clear of the deck and descending, Slip opened a satchel and tossed a half-dozen long knives up toward the prisoners, followed by a wry salute. The outside of the trussel's hull slipped past them, all holed and repaired and rusty. Jim tried to remember if he'd ever seen it from the outside. It had been his home for nearly all of his life, and he felt a sudden pang of anxiety. They drew level now with the tallest mast of the wooden ship, and Jim saw a black flag rippling in the wind, emblazoned with a white, winged hourglass. He wasn't sure if it was the queer swaying of the platform, but he felt suddenly nauseous. It must have shown, because Slip slapped him on the back hard. Cheer up, Jim. Life's about to get much more interesting. The wooden deck of the Archon could not have been more different than that of the Trossel. There were ropes everywhere, and bundled sheets of mismatched patchwork fabric for the sails, which he now realised seemed to be made of sun-bleached old clothes. When the platform finished its descent, they were met by a knot of wet, grinning pirates, all working swiftly to untie and unload the hall. Jim's tanks were whisked away and lashed to the gunwale, but he himself was left quite alone. A pretty boy with dark eyes and sharp features rushed to check over the injured pirates, handing out short lengths of medicable to those that could wait and herding those that couldn't below. Boulder, give me a hand, dear, he called as the recipient of the worst of the injuries, a gunshot wound to the shoulder, stumbled and fell to the deck. The huge Eastner boy with the barrel chest stopped what he was doing and gently scooped the injured boy up in his arms, ducking to follow. Jim felt his chest constrict as Caber strode across the deck with the tech spear in his arms, but he marched right past, tossing the tangle of broken parts to a fraught, chubby boy in a long, grubby robe. Not strong enough, Porks! The robed boy struggled to catch the bundle of broken shafts, and some of the parts clattered to the deck around him. Uh, right, yes, strong, he nodded, but then doubt seemed to catch him. Wait, you mean the charge or the build? Caber kept walking, but looked back at the pile of broken components, raising an eyebrow. What do you think? Hey Kay, is it true you've got donkey splice, bro? called a giggling boy from halfway up the foremast. Groaning with rage, Caber stomped off to quash the rumour. Right, yes. Okay, Caber, I- I'll fix it. No, er, uh, tussle. The wheezing, robed boy bent to retrieve the dropped lengths of spear and lost two more in the process. So, the pirates had a techsmith. Jim had never seen one of them up close the heretic engineers that fixed up the ancient tech. He wasn't sure what he expected in a techsmith, but this sweaty fat boy was not it. Jim wondered what other techs were aboard, and shivered as he remembered the broken shielding he'd been brought here to fix, and the metal creatures it was supposed to keep at bay. First, he'd need to fix his eyeglass. The broken, thrice-split image was making his head throb and doing nothing for the knot in his stomach. He loosened the string from around his head and pulled the old tinkered monocle from his bad eye, inspecting it. The frame was made to sit flush with his cheek, hiding as much of the deformed eye socket as possible, while the lens went some way to correcting the vision in his eye. The frame was buckled and bent where he'd fallen, and the lens was cracked in three places. He could fix the frame easy enough, but grinding the lens by hand had taken weeks of experimentation. He'd need to find a block of glass, or... There was a blur. A streak of red-green, and suddenly the eyeglass was gone, his hand left scratched and shaking where it had been. Jim cried out and followed the streak. A brightly coloured bird with a snaking long neck was powering its way upward through the rigging his eyeglass clutched in its talons. A half-dozen pirates nearby fell about laughing as Jim looked about aghast. What? What was that? That's Puggle. She's a fizzard, said a small bare-chested boy as he heaved a crate of plastics away. 
Lesson one, no shiny stuff on deck, or she'll have it, added an identical boy, grinning as he hefted the other side of the crate. Fezzard. Fezzards aren't real, Jim said as confidently as he could manage. They're just from fairy tales. Ah, you can tell her that when you climb up to fetch it, laughed Slip from behind Jim. And you can bring back the captain's hat when you do. He was stood with North, checking off the cargo as it was taken below. You're free to try, but I'd get used to the ship first. Sails move a thing differently to that motor of yours. Go see Boulder. He'll fetch you a hammock. He's for the brig, Slip, said the captain simply, appearing from the stern of the ship with Darge and Caber in tow. Slip hesitated, looking at all the gear that was being carried below. But the brig's full cap. Ain't no space with all this gear. The captain hesitated for a moment, weighing Jim with a hard stare. The other pirates looked on, silenced, and waiting for his response. The captain seemed to make up his mind and turned back to Slip. The gibbet, then, he said coldly, and Caber grinned gleefully over his shoulder as he spoke. Articles are clear, no exceptions. He had his chance to volunteer, decided he'd be better off on his workship. That makes him our prisoner. The gibbet was every bit as uncomfortable as Jim had feared. A small metal cage, barely big enough for a full-grown to curl up inside, that was lashed five feet up the mainmast. Jim was small enough to slip his feet through the bars and dangle his legs free, but it didn't help greatly. His bad eye streamed and stung in the salt air, unprotected as it was, but he'd forced himself to watch as the mismatched crew worked in surprising harmony to hoist and set the great patchwork sails. Unlike the Trossel's crew, who all wore greying overalls, there were no two pirates who looked the same, save the twins. The only sense of conformity between them, besides a lack of tidiness and cleanliness, was that each seemed to wear a small scrap of purple about themselves. For some it was a bandage, for others a handkerchief, all different, and yet all the same. From his position facing back from the central mast, he'd watched the crippled trossel disappear slowly toward the horizon as North worked the helm and held their course true. Slip was right. Sails did make the ship move differently to the trossel. The Archon heeled over every time she manoeuvred and would stay that way, leaning to port or to starboard for hours, buffeted and bucked occasionally by the gusting of the hot wind. The crew seemed to take the rocking in stride. Caber even seemed to walk straighter under sail than he did on a level surface, but lashed to the mast as he was, Jim began to feel violently ill and couldn't face the generous ration of salt rice when it was brought to him, much to the amusement of the crew. The pretty-looking boy they called Kelpie had appeared while the others were eating below. He looked tired, and now wore a bloody apron that looked like it had forgotten all memory of its original colour. But he, alone among the crew, smiled warmly, and Jim felt a genuine affection for him despite everything. He had applied a salve and bandages to Jim's burned forearms, drained the swelling beneath his good eye, and even given him a weed to chew that he promised would alleviate the sail sickness. It worked, and Jim found that the salt rice, though cold now, was spiced and flavoured cunningly. Kelpie showed a special concern for the aching wound between Jim's shoulder blades, and muttered darkly about tech burns and irresponsible bullies. It was awkward with the confines of the gibbet, but Kel gave Jim a length of medicable to bite down on, and set about scouring the wound with a cool liquid that burned horribly. That's enough of that, he said, taking the medicable back. I'll speak to the captain. We'll need to get that wound seen to. He gave a tired smile before turning to retire below deck. Oh, and here, he remembered, handing Jim a small strip of clean cotton bandage and gesturing to his bad eye. This will help the weeping. Jim bound it around his head, slanting down over the shrunken socket. The gentle rocking of the night breeze, the brief dose of licks and the full stomach helped Jim eventually find sleep, though it was uncomfortable and disturbed by dreams. 
The work started at dawn. Jim had been released from the gibbet to find that all the weld gear that had been liberated from the trussel had been fetched ready for him. Will Slippiner, who it seemed was the Archon's equivalent of the old bosun, had led him to the tall raised structure at the stern of the ship they called the castle to inspect the damage. The trussel's defenders had dropped a huge lump of scrap steel down upon the Archon, and it had torn right through an array of blue sunglass panels and into the deck below. Jim peered into the cavity and saw bent copper bars and splintered wood. The chubby, dark-skinned techsmith was hunched over in the ruins of the shielded room, salvaging scraps from the wreckage. We've had to shut everything down, explained Slip. Lots of trace coming out of there. Can you fix it? Gritting his teeth against the pain in his back and trying not to vomit from the sail sickness that was fast returning, Jim clambered down into the cavity to inspect the damage. The room was cramped. With the wreckage, there was barely enough space for Jim and the sweating techsmith, but every available space was crammed with tech. Jim gasped as his eye adjusted from the bright light on deck. There were wires trailing like spiders' webs across the shielded walls. Dark panels, some broken and some whole, clustered together in one corner like fragments of a shattered mirror. There were wide boards, covered in buttons, each with their own arcane symbol. Angular, mechanical arms hung from the ceiling. There was even a glass tank full of live magflies, less dangerous now on a ship made of wood. The techsmith was blinking nervously at Jim and wiped his face with a purple neckerchief. What do you think? he asked eagerly. Yeah, it's quite something. I've never seen tech up close. Is it, you know, safe? Oh, quite safe, yes. All powered down. I'm Willen, by the way. He stuck out his hand briefly, but then seemed to think better of it and pulled it back anxiously. I meant the shielding, though. Jim had quite forgotten the shielding. The whole room was cunningly lined with thick copper bar, which formed a shielded cage against the tech trace. The space within would be like an invisible bubble, except for the holes now ripped through the floor and ceiling. I have solder. I I wondered, perhaps, if we braze them? But my tools are not hot enough. The smith trailed off expectantly. Jim, Jim said, struggling to keep up with the boy's disjointed train of thought. And no. Brazing them won't work. You need a straight run of copper. That's how it's designed, I think. Shielding was alien to him, but he was already beginning to see the intent behind its construction. Waylon slapped himself on the forehead. Of course, I- I'm so stupid. Will, do we have copper? He called up through the hole in the ceiling. I'll go check yesterday's hole. Hold on. Soon Slip returned with a heavy casket of copper pipe and the huge barrel-chested pirate they called Boulder. The next several hours were spent sorting the splintered wood from the broken tech, while Boulder wrenched the bent and buckled copper bars back into shape with the help of a snatch block and line. Even through the rising nausea, Jim felt a tingle of guilty excitement every time he found a scrap of tech plate among the debris almost like his childhood fantasies of becoming a salvager, digging up the ruins of the ancients. I know what it's like, by the way, on a workship, Waylon said, when he saw Jim stop to fidget with the itching bandages on his forearms. It must have been horrible. You're from a workship? Jim asked, trying to hide his surprise. Engineers came in many shapes and sizes, but fat wasn't one of them. Long hours, small spaces, and even smaller rations simply didn't allow for it. Oh, well, yes. I was born on one. Waylon nodded sadly, scooping up the neckerchief that always seemed to be escaping from his neck. Your mother was on a workship. There was no hiding the surprise this time. Even stranger than a fat boy was a woman on board. Unless... Waylon seemed to see the calculation happen in Jim's mind. My father was the owner, he explained, clearly wishing he'd kept his mouth shut. My name is Waylon Smith. Of the Smith line, Jim gasped. 
The Smiths weren't Lear rich, not Gradlon rich, but with almost 50 workships in their fleet, they were heading in that direction. It's called that now, yes. I I was cast out when it was still just a small flotilla. Dad got in with the church and they didn't approve of the tech too well. Waylon perched against a worktop and mopped his brow with the abused neckerchief. In the end, the pars were more useful than family. And I was... Well, I had to go. Where are you from? Before, I mean. I don't really remember it. My parents... Well, they got me out before it got real bad. It was called Razine. It got bad there. Famine, I think. I always thought one day I might... Waylon stiffened and nudged Jim with his foot. Following his gaze, Jim found the captain was stood in the doorway, staring fixedly at Jim with a grim expression on his face. But as Jim met his eyes, he shook it off, blinked, and looked away. Nothing left for you and Razine, kid. Just parched earth and death. Jim blinked, taken off balance by the captain's words, and swallowed the sudden knot that twisted in his throat. Kelby tells me that wound in your back needs tending. He's not often wrong, the captain said stiffly, staring at the splintered doorframe. We're putting short Shoalhaven in three days. We'll have you seen to then. And with that, he turned to leave. But that wasn't enough for Jim, not nearly, and without pausing to think it through, he yelled after the captain. That's where you'll sell me then, Shoalhaven. The captain stopped then slowly turned and met Jim's eyes for the first time. I told you before, we aren't selling you. So what? I have to stay here, living in the gibbet? Jim snapped. Jim! Waylon whispered, tugging at his shirt. The captain shook his head. Oh no, you're not cut out for this life. We're not selling you because you don't belong to us. But you stole me from the trussle! Yeah. Well, you didn't belong to them either. And before Jim could process his words, the captain raised a hand, forbidding any reply, and whirled away. It took two days to fix up the shielding. Once Boulder had bent it all back into place, Jim set about fusing the rods back together, using hammered strips of the copper pipe as filler. It was slow and awkward work, but Jim found Waylon to be gentle company among the rough pirates, and the hard work made sleep come easier at night and the sail sickness fade, though he fumed over the captain's words often, not cut out for this life. Most of the crew avoided him and Waylon, who Jim was starting to realise was only barely more popular than himself, but sometimes Gamawan. The quiet boy with the acute hearing they called Gam would descend his lookout atop the foremast and sit with them while they worked. It turned out he was Darge's younger brother, though where she was stoic and confident and tall, he was shy and small and anxious, flinching at any sudden noise. But as the days went on, he grew used to Jim's company and began to reveal a mischievous sense of humour to match North's. Jim felt more comfortable at night, knowing that Gam was up there atop the foremast, keeping watch over the ship. There had been no warning from Waylon before he connected the power again, reattaching the remaining sunglass panels that fuelled the workshop. Jim had been clearing the last of the weld skag and broken glass from the floor when a great whirring began and a thousand small lights started to blink. Not the tremorous flicker of an oil lamp, but rhythmic pulses of green, blue and red tech light. Out of habit, Jim crossed himself as the cluster of dark panels began to wake into life, displaying scrolling glyphs and arcane shapes. Waylon began his work again immediately, fixing the many relics that had been broken in the battle, utterly trusting in Jim's handiwork. But it took a full day for Jim's anxieties about holes in the shielding and monsters on the horizon to die down. On the third night after his capture, Jim was allowed down from the gibbet in order to help Waylon with a task. Some of the pirates, it seemed, were still anxious about the proximity of tech and would avoid the castle wherever possible, spitting to avert evil if they were forced to get too close. 
but faced with the choice of spending the evening cooped up in the gibbet while others made merry on deck or hauling some tech around for Whalen, Jim decided he would take the heresy and risk of damnation any day. This was the last night before bringing a haul ashore, and tradition dictated that there should be a celebration. Celebrate too early, and you risked tempting the wrath of the sea and failing to bring the loot home, but leave it too late and you could find yourself accosted on shore before you had a chance to party. So tonight there would be drinking. North had converted an old salt water still for the production of hooch. Stories and music. Wayland's aim was to capture the music using some forbidden teching that would allow them to listen to it again and again without the musicians present. Jim didn't understand or even truly believe him, but his task was just to unspool long cable drums from the castle toward the raised platform on the front of the ship they called the Folk. The work was harder than it sounded, and the wound in his back protested angrily. The cables were heavy and stiff with plastic sleeves along their length, and there were a thousand obstacles, critical for the rigging of the ship, that needed to be avoided. Only when he had laid the first did Whalen explain they needed one for each instrument, and Jim found himself still sweating under the weight of the heavy cable drums long after the band had struck up their first tune, while Whalen wrung his hands and beseeched him to hurry. Will Slippener led the band, singing in a clear voice while bowing a deep hypnotic instrument with three coarse strings. Boulder produced a droning double pipe. Caber struck up a beat on a frame drum, while North played a high metallic fist whistle that sang out above the rest like a calling bird. The twins capered about on deck, dancing when the tune called for it. North's latest attempt at hooch was passed round for those brave enough to try it, and soon the mood was one of carefree abandon and joy. Even Darge, stoic and immovable until now, giggled with her brother as the twins began to wrestle after tripping one another mid-dance. This whole time, the captain had not appeared among his crew. Jim, keeping to the outskirts of the party lest he be discovered and locked back in the gibbet, spotted him, sat cross-legged, way out upon the bowsprit, staring out over the moonlit water ahead of them, with a scabbarded sword in his lap. Jim watched, puzzling at the boy with the pale skin and rusty hair who seemed so much older than his face. Waylon appeared from the castle, offering a cup. Oh, t- don't worry. It's not hooch, just stilled water, he added as Jim sniffed the cool liquid cautiously. Thanks for your help, Jim. It's not perfect, but we got the drum and the pipes pretty good. Jim nodded and sipped at the water, still watching the captain, who was now absently feeding scraps to the red-green mast bird that was circling nearby. Waylon settled in next to Jim with a tired sigh. She really is a feathered, you know. Wayland said gently. I didn't think they were real either, when I came aboard. Same with the fair folk. Thought they were just stories. Jim turned to him and raised an eyebrow sceptically. Fairies were even more absurd than pheasants. I know, I I know. He held up his hands defensively. I'd have called it all mad too, upon a time. He sipped at his water and looked up at the moon and her criss-crossed scars. Oh, but there's a lot out there, Jim. A lot. Our voyage through the world of the Risen Tide continues in the next chapter, which you can find by following the links on screen. New chapters will be uploaded on Monday and Thursday every week, so hit subscribe to stay up to date, or if you just can't wait, the full tale is available today on Audible, Spotify and Thanks for listening.